Welcome everyone to our discussion on COVID-19 and armed conflict. I'm Priyanka Modaparthi, the director of the project on armed conflict, counterterrorism and human rights at Columbia Law School. I'll be moderating today's discussion. Today's event is part of the COVID-19 Advancing Rights and Justice During a Pandemic virtual event series that is convened by the Columbia Law School Human Rights Institute, Duke Law's International Human Rights Clinic, Columbia Law School's Center for Gender and Sexuality Law, and Just Security. As we have learned during the course of this pandemic, while we are all vulnerable to both the virus and its many ripple effects, we are not equally vulnerable. Factors such as poverty, lack of access to healthcare and clean water, living in densely populated areas and historic inequalities, all of these have magnified the scale of harm. In some very stark ways, in some very stark ways, this pandemic has magnified and brought into relief society's harshest inequalities. We have seen this play out on a very local scale in New York City, on a national scale, and we have, we have and continue to see these inequities play out on a global scale. There may be no populations for which we have greater concern than those living in countries affected by armed conflict, where health systems have often been decimated by years of war, supply chains for essential goods and humanitarian aids are disrupted or manipulated, and large numbers of people live in close proximity, particularly in displacement camps. There are significant risks for detainees, including prisoners of war and political prisoners. And there are endemic problems the health and rights of vulnerable and marginalized groups in the countries at war, conflict-driven spending, and corruption. Some of the threats are clear and some may be less obvious. At the same time, the fears around the threat this virus presents could help drive collective action. The UN Secretary General has called for a global ceasefire, and at local levels as well, we, see may, we may see more opportunities for peace and appetite for dialogue than at any time in prior years. We have with us today an excellent group of speakers who can provide us with very different perspectives on both the threats and opportunities to better protect the lives of those living under conflict. They are Kate Kaiser, Policy Director at Win Without War, Azadeh Moavini, Director of the Gender and Conflict Project at the International Crisis Group, Cordula Drog, Chief Legal Officer at the International Committee for the Red Cross, and Farah Muslimi, co-founder and chairman of the Sana Center for Strategic Studies. Each of them will speak for about eight minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A session for the remainder of our time. Participants can tweet questions using the hashtag COVID19Justice or by using the question and answer function in Zoom. We look forward to receiving your questions. Kate, why don't you start us off? Thanks, Priyanka. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'd like to start off with some general framing of the crisis that we face and the need for bold structural changes, to not only how the US conducts itself on the world stage, but also um, international cooperation writ large. As Priyanka alluded to, um, this crisis truly has revealed deep weaknesses um, in the current and political order, both here in the United States, as well as internationally. And we've already started to see um, certain actors try to take advantage of the crisis and chaos it's created to, from authoritarian power grabs in Hungary to uh, the border closure announced by tweet last night um, by Donald Trump. Um, and what's needed is really a fundamental rethinking of security um, and a social compact between people and their government. And Win Without War is a national grassroots advocacy organization, and we put out a call of five demands for U.S. foreign policy to really fundamentally rethink how the United States shapes security. For the, at least the last two decades, if not longer, the U.S. has really focused on a 
investment in maintaining military dominance around the world as a means to build security. Fundamentally, that approach has relied on policies that make others less secure um, to purportedly make Americans more secure. But what that's resulted in is the United States fighting endless wars in dozens of countries around the world. One of the greatest mass displacement crises we faced since World War II and growing levels of a pernicious nationalism and racism here at home, all while ignoring one of the greatest transnational threats we all face in the climate crisis. And so the five demands that we outlined, we believe that this crisis, this global health crisis, really presents an opportunity for a fundamental paradigm shift and US foreign policy that if actually invested in wholeheartedly could also lead a fundamental reform internationally and in how different countries interact and prioritize building security, not only for citizens within their own country, but also prioritizing safety and justice for all around the world. First and foremost, that looks like not investing $1 more in weapons of war, um, endless war, or the Pentagon. The United States invests nearly a trillion dollars per year in the military and defense manufacturing, all of which to further its military dominance around the world. But ultimately, the growing transnational crises that we face in the 21st century from this global pandemic to things like the climate crisis fundamentally do not have a military solution. And so we need to first and foremost, think about how we are funding not only physical security, but economic security. And that requires deep structural investments, not only in things like democratic reform, but also economic resiliency, um, healthcare, and other mechanisms that will actually build holistic human security for people around the world. And we should also be prioritizing building that for other people around the world, because that is the primary way to mitigate violence um, and prevent conflict, rather than fueling more conflict by thinking that we can bomb our way to peace. Second, um, the US has really weaponized um, its the US financial system, particularly under Donald Trump, but this has been going on for years, through a web of mass, often sectoral sanctions on countries that it wants to change its behavior. And more often than not, this, these broad sectoral sanctions often harm the people most vulnerable in these societies, whether in Iran, North Korea, or Cuba, as well as other countries like Venezuela, that the current sanctions regime that the U.S. has on these countries only compounding the health crises um, that regular folks face in these countries. So first and foremost, the United States should immediately suspend sanctions, at least temporarily, for the duration of this crisis, and then ultimately end them. Because the academic literature actually shows that sanctions more often breed corruption and authoritarianism. And so if the goal of US sanctions is actually to create policy change, to end human rights abuses, um, to foment democratic governance and accountable governance, then we should be actually investing in other tools to facilitate that change that actually uplifts um, movements within these societies who are demanding change on their own terms. Third, um, one thing that this administration has been doing for several years um, and obviously has only been compounded by this crisis is the gutting of the United States refugee um, and asylum programs. Um, we've seen his, you know, tweeting about his border wall, diverting Pentagon funds to build the border wall, basically um, ending the refugee um, program by lowering the cap so low, denying people asylum and sending them back to unsafe countries. And so first and foremost in this crisis, if we are to be more secure, well, no matter in what country um, we are living in, we have to recognize that we need to be welcoming and defending the rights and dignity of those seeking safety outside their countries of origin. Ultimately, we can become more safe if we're providing refuge and protections and humanitarian assistance versus creating humanitarian assistance crises on our borders like we're doing right now at the US Southern border. Um, fourth is prioritizing international cooperation instead of competition. We've already seen um, 
pundits from kind of all different sides of the political spectrum blaming China for this crisis, which has fur further calls for more militarization of the U.S. competition with China and the, the claimed threat that China, the rise of China poses to U.S. power. But ultimately, again, these shared security challenges that we all face from the climate crisis to global pandemics to things like grand corruption and growing authoritarianism cannot be solved by ending international cooperation, gutting the multilateral system and militarizing our way out of this problem. We have to be investing deeply in international cooperation to create coalitions of countries acting for the same goals. Um, and fundamentally, if we allow uh, fear mongering to cut off opportunities at cooperation, we ourselves will be less safe because we will be cutting off vital lifelines that we need to address these um, shared security threats like climate change. And finally, because of the fundamental flaws that this crisis has revealed in our system and to prepare for the crises of the future and the seismic shifts that are going to occur from things like the climate crisis to the U.S. and global economies, we should be investing in a green just transition now through things like a, global, a green new deal. Ultimately, we know that the climate crisis is coming. The UN has said we have 10 years to actually mitigate the worst effects of the climate crisis. And so if we do not start preparing now, we will be yet again left flat footed in the face of another grand scale crisis. And so because this crisis has really bottomed out the US and global economies and threatens to do even more pain than the Great Depression, it's a prime opportunity to actually fundamentally rethink how we build an economy that not no longer just serves the interests of elites and corporations, but actually focuses on the needs of workers and regular people and puts environmental protections at the forefront. This not only can help us mitigate the climate crisis, it can forward a new social compact between people and their governments that undermined the flavor of nationalism that we're seeing take hold around the world, and also end the focus on military means of security that have led the U.S. to fuel conflict around the world. Um, so I will leave it there. It's kind of a larger picture framing. I know a lot of my panelists colleagues will have some other great framing. Thank you so much, Kate, for that look at what we could be doing with U.S. foreign policy and a different way forward that could be better envisioned and better actualized through the vehicle of this pandemic. Azadeh, let's turn to you now. Can you tell us, can you share with us what you have seen in your work as some of the biggest, both the biggest threats and some of the opportunities presented by this, by this crisis? Um, absolutely. Thank you, Priyanka. Um, and just to say quick, seems to go, it seems to go out every four minutes for some reason, but then it comes back. So hopefully you can hear me. Um, so, uh, and, and thank you, um, Kate, for that, for that framing. Um, I think I'll speak uh, to two countries that can kind of look at that, um, that kind of, um, uh, essentially that theoretical framing in, in some specific context. Um, and and uh, certainly um, Kate mentioned Iran, um, and I'll talk about Iran to start with. Um, it has been the country most severely impacted in the Middle East uh, by the virus. It was also the most uniquely vulnerable potentially um, when the virus struck its economy was straining heavily under the weight of US sanctions along with uh, domestic mismanagement. Uh, the government was quite slow to respond um, although in retrospect, many governments were quite slow to respond. Um, but once it realized the scale and the scope of what was, what was happening, it was hampered by US sanctions in responding um, in a way that really did bring about um, total calamity for the country. Um, uh, 
setting up some of the context, a large uh, percentage of the Iranian population, like many developing countries, relies on daily labor to be able to feed itself. Uh, so shutting down the economy without being able to implement like a massive social safety net, which Iran simply can't afford to do right now, uh, wasn't feasible. Um, the countries working poor who have been most impacted by the economic crisis uh, were already suffering malnutrition, ill health, you know, as a result of the declining economy. Uh, when this hit. So they were physically more susceptible uh, to begin with. And I imagine the case is very similar in places like Venezuela. Um, so at the height of the pandemic in Iran on Persian New Year, for example, that was a day when an Iranian was dying every 10 minutes from the virus. Um, the figures today, uh, because of the lack of testing, are 83,000 confirmed cases and over 5,000 deaths. But I think we know that it is um, at least certainly uh, a few times that. Um, so the big difficulty for Iran, um, which it was facing before the pandemic, uh, but that was exacerbated by it, was its inability to purchase humanitarian goods on the international market as a result of U.S. sanctions. Um, we had been seeing the impact of that with uh, the treatment of pediatric cancer patients who were dying before the virus hit. Um, and, and when this unfolded, you know, the inability to buy, um, to buy drugs, medicines, and the ingredients that Iran needs uh, to to build into a lot of uh, the resources that it needs um, were simply um, out of reach. Um, there is a Swiss sponsored channel uh, that has been meant to facilitate humanitarian trade. I think hopefully it's back. Yeah, okay. Uh, this Swiss sponsored channel um, hadn't processed that was intended to allow Iran to bring in humanitarian goods under US sanctions, had not processed a single transaction uh, before COVID hit. Uh, the demands by the US were simply so onerous that many who were working with it, trying to get it to work, including the Swiss, just simply felt like it was designed to be unusable. Um, so in practice, this sort of meant that um, Iran was not able to bring in what it, what it needed. Iran has a quite sophisticated manufacturing base. Uh, the result of years of isolation has been that it's developed a quite independent manufacturing base. So it can make certain medicines, it can make P some PPE, it can make disinfectants, but it does need to rely on, rely on external supply chains to bring in some of the ingredients for that production. Um, but for Iran to simply uh, find new suppliers, scale up, uh, get more goods into the country as it needs, as every country to do when COVID-19 unfolded uh, was out of reach for Iran. It simply couldn't. Um, and quickly to explain why, um, the imposition of secondary U.S. sanctions, which means simply the way that they impact non-American um, trading companies around the world, um, has really meant that transport into Iran of goods is, is very compromised. Um, airlines, shipping companies have backed away from the Iranian market. So it makes it hard for Iran to move goods even physically into its airports and ports. Uh, at the end of February, when the WHO was trying to get COVID testing kits into Iran, it struggled. It tried to fly them in through the UAE. It couldn't, it had to send them to Iraq and try and fly them in through Baghdad eventually. Um, you know, even, even at that moment, uh, at such urgency, it was a struggle to get things into Iran. Uh, delivery aside, uh, the licenses that companies have to apply for from the US Treasury to be able to get certain products, um, medical exports specifically into Iran are, are onerous. Things like oxygen generators, uh, facial respiratory masks, thermal imaging equipment. These are things that were important to Iran's COVID response. Um, but companies have to apply for special licenses to be able to, to process those transactions. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, the, the state of that, in early 2019, only 10% of these kinds of special licenses were being approved by the Treasury. Um, for those enough uh, who are uh, old enough uh, to have worked on Iraq during oil for food, uh, this kind of decline of a theoretical humanitarian program, you know, like death by a thousand bureaucratic pinpricks uh, will be very familiar. Um, leading us to like the biggest problem of all for Iran is banks. Banks just won't facilitate financial transactions for Iran. Um, there was some criticism of Iran at the outset of the outbreak. Uh, for not, uh, excellent, for not accepting um, some one-offs of charity. Uh, and the point that Iran's leadership was trying to make at that point was that it didn't really need one-offs of charity. It needed to be able to use its own money to buy what it needed to protect its own people from this pandemic. And, and to be able to do that, it needs to be able to use 
the banking sector. It needs to be able to process transactions through banks. Um, so the Instex channel, that humanitarian aid channel that I mentioned earlier, um, has really only got up and running in the last few weeks. Um, and we can see that, you know, you, you asked Priyanka, what are some of the opportunities being presented by the pandemic? Sort of one aspect um, is this, you know, real uh, sort of you know, deadlock between Iran and the United States. Um, and it seems like Europe in particular has been spurred into some action in sort of getting this humanitarian channel up and running because it's working. Uh, we've seen um, we've seen some political dynamics changing um, and, and perhaps uh, when Iran pushes, uh, it's applied unprecedentedly for a $5 billion emergency loan from the IMF to aid its response. Perhaps we'll see uh, some support for, for it securing that loan. Um, if I have just a couple of minutes, um, uh, if I may, uh, well, then I will be very, very brief. Um, we know that displaced populations are especially vulnerable to outbreaks of disease. And at Crisis Group, we've worked uh, quite a lot on Syria, both the Northeast and the Northwest, um, and have identified it as one of the most high risk areas of active conflict that will be vulnerable uh, to, to COVID. I think alongside Yemen, which we'll be hearing about imminently, I think. Um, and it probably, these areas of Syria, of Syria share themes with Yemen in that they were already experiencing massive health crises, health infrastructure completely destroyed by years of war, not rebuilt, um, already looking at situations in displacement camps that were you know, humanitarian disasters before COVID unfolded. Um, we've been in touch with um, and have written about particular camps uh, in Northeast Syria where, you know, 70,000 IDPs and most of them women. And, and we do kind of stress that there's a real gender differentiated impact to the uh, experiences of, of IDPs. Uh, and, and we, we anticipate it will be with COVID because the majority of them are simply women. So panic, women unable to access um, even health information, you know, trying Trying to text relatives from around the world to figure out what to do. Um, a very, very sort of dire uh, and scary predicament for them because they're already cut off, you know, already finding it difficult to access services. Um, this problem exists also in Iraq um, and again disproportionately felt by women uh, because of stigma associated with perceived or potentially real affiliation with all take this as a as a as a nod to add up um, but that this is uh, a, a very serious problem for displaced for displaced populations uh, who also in in certain places in Syria certainly um, and this will be my last point um, are dependent on aid that is dependent on politics because even the politics of getting aid into Syria gets decided at the UN Security Council where Russia and other countries are battling out you know big picture of political uh, problems with each other um, in ways that will impact these very vulnerable communities. Thank you, Azadeh, for both that look at the situation and the impact of sanctions on Iran in the current situation, as well as a look at displaced populations. And I think your, your comments really reminded us that, you know, what conflict has really taught us is that it's not only about the urgency or scale of humanitarian need or human suffering. It is also very much about those politics that are governing what can come to countries in need and, and what, what people can access no matter how dire the, nears, the needs on the ground are. Now we'll turn to Cordula, who will give us a look at the international legal framework, and in particular, the principles that the ICRC is emphasizing in the current crisis. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone, and, and thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me to, to be on, the, on, on, your, on your webinar. It seems to be working very well so far, so good. Um, so you've, you've asked me to talk a bit about uh, the, the legal framework and, um, and particularly, of course, in, in, in situations of armed conflict, so um, where international humanitarian law applies. I try not to use too many acronyms, but I do talk about IHL a lot. Um, and I, th I have two points, basically. My first point is that the vulnerability of people to pandemics come sort of is is differentiated between uh, different people in populations. This is the case in peacetime as well as in wartime. You have a health impact on people and then you have a direct uh, socioeconomic and so on impact in particular, of course, now with these with all these lockdown measures. And so it's, of course, not surprising uh, 
that in situations of armed conflict where you have extremely vulnerable populations, the impact of a pandemic uh, is exacerbated because um, not only are people vulnerable, but that's perhaps the one thing that I want to stress very much is the infrastructure um, is um, slowly but surely eroded over the years of conflict. And most of the conflicts that we see today around the world are what we often call protracted conflicts. So they last over many, many years. Now, of course, every conflict will always come with its toll of suffering. Um, even if all the rules are respected, conflict will um, you know, erode uh, infrastructure, people will be killed, keep, people will be wounded. Um, the coping mechanisms will erode social, uh, social um, fabrics. But um, we also know that a lot of the vulnerability of people in armed conflict and in particular in the situation of pandemic, which requires essential services, is due to the lack of respect for the rules of war, for international humanitarian law, in the sense that to combat a pandemic, you need essential services, you need water, you need sanitation, you need medical care, health care, and you need staff. All of these ingredients for a response to a pandemic are often falling victims of the activities of belligerent belligerents in an armed conflict. So for instance, the rules on the conduct of hostilities require belligerents to respect distinction, proportionality, precaution. And yet we know that over the years in conflicts like Yemen, like Syria, like the DRC, hospitals have been deliberately targeted, um, water installations have been targeted, um, electricity has been uh, damaged. Uh, we know that the use of explosive weapons, even when of explosive weapons with a wide area effect, even when used against military objectives, and even if it isn't per se unlawful, um, has had such humanitarian consequences that it raises serious questions about the way belligerents have respected the principles of distinction and proportionality, with the consequence that in places like Yemen or Syria, more than half of the hospitals are actually out of order or destroyed in Iraq, in the DRC, etc. So the vulnerability of people in armed conflict comes from years of disrespect for international humanitarian law also. Um, and it is, you know, it's been repeated many times over that the indirect, the third and, and the second and third tier effects of conflict are just as, um, as stark in armed conflict as the immediate suffering. And it seems to me that COVID-19 is an illustration of exactly that phenomenon. Um, these consequences are foreseeable and they are the result of choices by the belligerents in armed conflict. So the situation of vulnerability we are in is a result of that, of those choices. Now that leads me to my second point, which is uh, quickly made and in a way flows very clearly from the first one, which is let's not um, exas exacerbate these vulnerabilities even more um, when um, uh, when designing the response to the pandemic, it has to be done uh, based on human rights and based on international humanitarian law. A public health response will only be effective, but also only be humane if it is human rights based and IHL based. Um, and so in particular, um, you know, there has to be respect, first of all, for the rules on the conduct of hostilities. Um, so that essential infrastructure and essential services can work and, and respond to the needs of populations. Um, there has to be um, particular respect for uh, the medical mission, for hospitals, for hospital staff, medical, um, medical relief, um, medical care has to come without any distinctions other than based on medical criteria. Um, and of course, also, there are many rules in uh, international humanitarian law and international human rights law uh, protecting the particular um, groups in the population to be received with adequate uh, shelter, food, uh, hygiene, and sanitation. And yet, of course, we know this is often not done. Um, you, have, um, you have rules on persons with disabilities who are particularly impacted 
uh, also in a pandemic on children, on women, and all of these rules should be respected in, in, uh, in designing the public health response. Now, uh, Priyanka, uh, just as a, as a last point, perhaps because at the very beginning you were talking about um, um, opportunities and risks also for, from this pandemic for, um, uh, for respecting the rules. And, and, and I think there are opportunities and risks that we see. So for instance, I think we've seen that in, in places of detention, um, in displacement camps, there's been particular efforts being made uh, also by, by certain authorities to, um, to improve uh, the situation. Um, so for, when you look, for instance, in places of detention, which is a place which are places the ICRC works a lot, you know, a lot of water installations have been, uh, have been installed very quickly, uh, soap is being distributed. There have also been actually um, many states that have released uh, detainees, sometimes by the thousand, um, you know, either through, uh, through pardons, through early release, etc., of certain um, um, perhaps less threatening uh, populations, if I may call it this. Um, there's also, um, you know, of course, the public health measures of installations will impact uh, family links, but there have been uh, quite interesting ways of re-establishing family links with the outside world for detainees. There's also been an interesting phenomenon of non-state armed groups having to all of a sudden um, take on almost, um, you know, state-like functions, um, having a public health response, um, establishing quarantines, uh, specific, in, um, you know, quarantine places, etc. So, so there's, that also creates an opportunity, I think, to speak with those groups and, and to, to engage in a, in a, in a good dialogue. Um, so there are, there are, I think, also uh, opportunities in there, but there are, of course, also the, the difficult threats and, and risks that we saw. Kate has talked about them as a day, I would, um, I would say, and I can perhaps come back to it later in the Q&A. Um, we have risks for humanitarian access because of all the compounded obstacles, which were already counterterrorism measures, sanction regimes, and now you have public health measures, which are, of course, legitimate, but this, it's, it's very much often about a balance to be found. And perhaps my last thing um, on that is that we have heard a lot about, you know, states of emergency, war metaphors. Um, and the war metaphor for a pandemic is, of course, very um, understandable. Um, and often we speak about people who are on the front line, like health workers, and we, we want to speak about it like this because they kind of are and, and we want to support it. But we also, I think, have to be aware that, that the war metaphor um, can, be, um, can also be risky because it, it sort of implies that extreme measures are possible. And so there's a risk of such extreme measures actually being taken either through you know, arbitrary detention, excessive use of force, uh, you know, um, certain agendas about uh, uh, you know, completely undermining asylum rights, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have to be careful also about the, the choice of our words. Words matter in this as well, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that was an important point to end on. Words do matter and the, the actions of governments that are taken during this time of crisis could, of course, last much longer than that. Uh, with that, let's turn to Farah. Uh, Farah, we're really looking forward to your comments on Yemen, which we understand the WHO announced the first documented case of coronavirus in Yemen about a week ago, um, but the spread has, as far as we know, remained relatively small. Can you give us your take on the situation there and, and what we should be looking for and what we should expect? Sure, what I would uh, first thank you very much for the invite and everyone and uh, for uh, having a man quota in this exceptionally woman um, panel, which is a quite amazing. Um, thank you for considering that gender balance. Um, that being said, uh, I do want to, I, I can talk a bit about what you asked for, but I also want to point out almost on what the uh, uh, speakers before me were building as a case. Um, and I think one of the most important thing we have seen in this part of the world is how regimes and governments have used the pandemic actually in a way to shut down social movements, to shut down political rights, and almost to uh, 
thrive as in non-state actors, but also as a world sites in some times. And in a way, how this pandemic have shifted sometimes um, social movements um, is a quite unbelievable somehow in the region. I live in Lebanon and uh, since almost 10 years in total. Um, and from October last year, we saw an unbelievable social movement that actually shaked the entire sectarian system in the country. And nothing was able to stop it actually, except the Corona. Um, and this really now the streets is over and sectarian groups are very happy and actually much a thrill that there is something who took people out of the street for them. You look, for example, around you into the region and you look into a country like Jordan, putting also emergency laws, um, which is already a police state. When you look into the measures what they put together actually to also thrive as a regime, but also to make this conversation as almost a military police state conversation rather than a public health one. It's a quite amazing what you've seen. Um, for the first three days, for example, the, the lockdown, how the government shut down everything and the Minister of Information in TV told people, you know, for like three days we're going to give you breads and toilet paper and even cigarettes, you will start distributing it. It's a version of 1984, older brother. You know, we know how many times you're even going to the bathroom. We know how many cigarettes you need a day. Um, and it's a striking in a way. And when you look, for example, into the response there, it fits very perfectly in USA ID measures. And actually a lot of countries are looking up for, this, uh, for the way how Jordan actually is dealing with the pandemic. But you know what ultimately did is, even in the speech of the king, half of it is actually thanking armed forces rather than the doctors and nurses. But it tells you of how regimes were able to build on it. You walk a bit around to Algeria, for example, and you have a revolution there that was actually shook up also a regime that was one of the bloodiest and actually most corrupt and strongest that have survived the first Arab Spring wave. What actually helped get people out of the street in Algeria? Again, Corona. So it's a way of how you see, even for example, the Saudis were able to allocate who are their citizens that goes to Iran without also visa security by tracking down those who actually had the coronavirus at the beginning. So you can see how some sort also in the neighborhood where I live, you get all different sectarian groups walking around, for example, with their microphones, but also, you know, um, with some services trying to Yes, sometimes open a door, but also replace the state and find a narrative of their own um, to replace the state. Um, that's a similar also in the region somehow, despite the pandemic going home, Iran has not really behaved in the region. It's still meddling in countries, despite what it's facing internally. You look the same to Saudi Arabia. It has shut down most of the planes into the country or basically all the movement. But there are still one type of planes that not stopped, and these are the planes flying over Yemen, bombing Yemen. So somehow, some sort of these regimes, despite the urgency and the indifference, or, or, or the, probably the massive scale of how crazy this is, they're still not behaving as they should be, even in the most or in the least possible indicators. Um, that applies to Yemeni sides. You know, you see what you see, how the Houthis are looking into it, for example. Um, they obviously even further using it to say, um, the only front lines, the only place in Yemen actually where it is corona free is the front line. So using it even as a measure to take youth actually um, to the to fight with them. There isn't so far neither from the Houthis nor from the government any sense of urgency or indifference um, or I mean any sense of freely how this because they need to do a lot of things including ideally including uh, for example listening to the UN call and releasing all the prisoners. This is something there. Um, and this is something possible and they need to do it as soon as possible. It is never really considered that or really care about it. Um, similarly, the Yemeni government have not really done what it should be doing for a lot of reasons, obviously. I think, however, the one thing that this brings is, you know, as many speakers before me have pointed out very uh, eloquently, is it is an opportunity in a way if there is enough international pressure around ending these kind of stupid wars, more or less. Um, this creates, for example, a momentum around what the UN envoy have been doing in Yemen. In a way, if you have the right diplomatic architect and the right countries behind uh, diplomacy on Yemen, I think this is also an exceptional face saving a chance for Saudi, actually, to say, OK, okay there is something bigger, and now we're going to move with it. And that applies to the other side. They, you have a health system that's already destroyed in a way. Huh? This is not going to be easy or hit. You see how this have already hit countries with a strong health system, 
or better, let alone a country where 80% were already in need of a humanitarian aid. So yeah, there is urgency somehow. There is a door there that can be built on. But what I am afraid of is regimes so far and militias have been much faster in capturing this moment and capitalizing on it than UN envoys. I'll come back later if there is any question, but thank you. Thank you so much for that, Farah. That was a very, um, very concise yet insightful look into what's happening in Yemen. I think it gives people a good, at least, taste of, of what the initial response is looking like. So just a reminder for all of you who are joining us, if you would like to send questions to the panelists, you can do so either through Twitter using the hashtag COVID19Justice, or you can do so through the question and answer function in Zoom, and we hope you have questions. Uh, we won't be able to get to all of them. We have about 19 minutes left together, but we can address some. So I'll just begin with a question to both Farah and to Azadeh. Some of the words that, you know, we've spoken a lot about the vulnerability of populations and people to this virus. Another word that has come up a lot in conversations around the pandemic is interconnectedness and how, you know, how a threat to one or a threat to few can quickly become a threat to many. We've even seen political leaders affected and, and harmed by this virus. How do you see political leaders in both Yemen and Iran responding to the situation? Do they, are they taking into account that sense of interconnectedness? Are they using this moment to, to come to greater dialogue or to, um, to, to make some positive changes? Or do you see them using the moment differently? Farah, why don't you begin since you were just speaking? I mean, the thing is, um, that's what I would like to think. That's what I want to pray for. Um, it doesn't seem the actions really on the ground kind of really tells you that, makes you excited, or actually see that you know, really everyone is noticing how stupid the wars we have been fighting, and now there is a war that if we lose that framework, you know, that really threat that threatens all of us. Um, my information is there are some breakthrough. Um, but I think the problem with Yemen also is the conflict is partially civil war, partially proxy war, and partially everything else. Um, and then you need a lot of layers to be able to really kind of knock down this conflict. Uh, but what, it's, what, what is possible, in my opinion, uh, and it's a bit of a repetition, is to use it as a, a break for the exchange of prisoners. Um, and that's because that's very important, but that's also feasible and there is benefits for both sides in doing that. So far, the indifference of both, um, both sides is scary. Um, and I haven't seen really strong actions on it. But overall, we shouldn't, I think, in my opinion, when it comes to warlords and war sites, we should never really gamble on their you know upper hands and in, in their upper sometimes they will wake up and think you know we should stop doing bad stuff i think in order of pushing them into it into kind of having a buy-in for peace you can't really gamble on these people's intentions good hopes and good thoughts if they had them ever you would never start this war i do think somehow there is a way to start probably the escalation measures like the exchange of prisoners and that's not a bad if it happens it's very important what about you? Um, I think uh, on Iran, there's certainly been cause to to be hopeful, um, witnessing some of the the developments that have unfolded um, since the pandemic hit Iran. Um, I think Iran's I think one fact about Iran and the fact that Iran was a sort of uh, transmit point to a lot of countries for the virus underscored that Iran is like this big 80 million country at a very significant geostrategic crossroads, it, it ends up being dangerous, isolating and blockading Iran and pretending that it has no legitimate security aspirations, you know, trying to choke it off economically. I think we saw the cost uh, of, of that in, in the way that Iran um, as a kind of, as a sort of Silk Road's, you know, pivotal role ended up spreading. Um, the virus. Um, I think there's been a couple of things. I mean, on dialogue, I think there has been important dialogue with Europe um, and we can see 
through the, uh, the activation of the humanitarian channel that I talked about. And then on the side, you've seen Iran uh, release or furlough some detained European Iranian dual nationals. We've seen that there has been um, space for a release in exchange for, I think, essentially the activation of this humanitarian channel. Um, I think Iran's leaders are certainly trying to use this moment. I mean, they're finally getting some attention uh, around the cost of sanctions. I mean, they've been going on about this for months, years, uh, but finally there's traction because everyone is confronting um, a similar threat and Iran's particular vulnerability, I think, is on display and it wasn't before. So they're sort of, I think, getting hearing on sanctions and are really trying to, to leverage that and maximize that. And I think there's been resonance. Um, I think you hear calls to lift sanctions. The Pope called for the lifting of sanctions. Um, they're the very broad-based signature uh, group of signatures, including uh, the Democratic nominee for President Joe Biden, um, calling for sanctions for Iran to be lifted right now um, in reflection of, of the pandemic. Um, so I think that they're, uh, you know, sort of tragically, it has afforded an opportunity for some movement um, on, on some of these points. Uh, gosh. Uh, things that Iran um, has been asking for, um, sort of opportunities for uh, a back and forth um, that hadn't really presented themselves before, given the state of the deadlock. Um, I think Iran is looking very much ahead to this IMF loan as a way to uh, marshal some of the, 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 the attention and support it has gotten around the impact of sanctions on its population uh, and to push for this. And I think it will be uh, very important to watch as we see countries um, as we see Europe also, and countries like Iran try and figure out how to navigate uh, this, this situation they find themselves in where the impact of US sanctions is, has this sort of totalizing effect uh, on their prospects as a nation. You know, the whole continents like Europe find themselves very much not on board, but also squeezed because of uh, the power of the US economy. Uh, so in a way, I think Iran's fate will this, um, fate with this uh, in this moment will have uh, a lot of political implications um, to come in, in lots of different ways. Thank you for that. We have now a question for Cordula. It's, uh, the question basically asks, uh, how should we consider the role of non-state armed groups who control access to public resources in areas of territory? What are some of the issues that should be prioritized with non-state armed groups and what are some of the particular obligations that they have in the current moment? So as, um, as parties to conflicts, non-state armed groups, of course, have the same uh, obligations to provide for the basic needs of populations under their control. So if non-state armed groups have control over territory, as we have in certain places like Yemen, the Ukraine, uh, um, and, and other places. Um, so that, and that's sort of the first, uh, the first obligation. And then they have obligations specific, for instance, to detainees, you know, to treat detainees humanely, to, um, you know, provide also the healthcare uh, to detainees. But of course, the problem is often a, a problem of, um, of capacity. Um, and for instance, when we think now, and Azadeh was, and I'll give it as an example, maybe Azadeh was mentioning um, earlier on the situation in Northeast Syria, um, where of course, uh, you know, you have camps, for instance, in particular, the camp of Al-Hol, where we have um, and now, I think 60,000 people, two thirds of um, uh, 60,000 people who, who are almost all uh, women and children. Um, and there just simply isn't the capacity to uh, you know to have the basic needs for for these people um, there isn't also the capacity to detain uh, other people um, in, in in conditions that are that are uh, you know according to even the, the most basic standard of common article 3 to the Geneva conventions let's say um, so in those situations then you have an obligation um, to allow um, and facilitate what we call humanitarian relief. What does this mean? So this is also an obligation of governments. Of course, it's an obligation of all belligerents, which is basically, which says that um, in armed conflict, impartial humanitarian organizations have, an, um, have a right to offer their services to the belligerents. And um, 
And when those services are truly impartial and humanitarian, um, they should be, well, they have to be consented to um, unless, um, yeah, exactly. Unless, for instance, they're not impartial. So let's say you're only providing, you're only proposing services for one specific religious group or one politically affiliated group or, or something like that. Now, of course, belligerents can still impose measures of control. So for instance, the government can impose public health measures, same for a non-state armed group. They actually have an obligation probably to impose public health measures in such a in such a situation. And so then it's a question of balancing of on the one hand, taking measures to uh, you know, stop the virus or at least uh, you know, stop the, the spreading as much as possible. Um, and at the same time, not basically um, being self-defeating and thereby uh, completely depriving people of humanitarian access. So in the camp of Al Hall, for instance, the ICSC is still um, working uh, in that camp, uh, trying to, you know, uh, help um, have better sanitation, uh, continuing to have a, a field hospital, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, the reason why I'm also mentioning this camp is because it's also illustrative of the limitations that there exists. And and this camp, for instance, is a camp where people shouldn't be. You know, this is not a place where children, in particular, should be. And um, the ICRC, for instance, has called um, particularly for third uh, countries, so those who are not Syrians or, or Iraqis, to repatriate their, um, their nationals, because this is just not a place where they will be able uh, to, to live according to standards that are necessary, particularly children, but also women. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there is a limit to what can be done. Uh, in situations of armed conflict and you have to be realistic about the expectations, in particular expectations towards non-state armed groups uh, and, in, and in, in, the, in, that particular, in that particular situation. I think uh, the best, uh, the best uh, course of action would be for third, uh, for third countries to repatriate their nationals. Now, um, this was already difficult before COVID. I don't think it's going to get any easier um, but I think it, it needs to, that, that conversation needs to continue and it needs to be, to, to uh, remain on the, on the agenda. Thank you. And we have a quick uh, follow-up or another question for you while, we, while you're up. Um, one person has asked, how can IHL be interpreted to secure the obligation to facilitate an unimpeded access to humanitarian aid? In light of the many travel restrictions and border closures that are being introduced to combat the spread of the pandemic, so we yeah, say, that's a very yeah. good um, that's a very good question. And again, I think it it is about finding a balance. So, as I said, once you have an offer of services of impartial humanitarian organizations and consent by the parties, you it is obvious that parties can still impose measures of control. So these, let's say, talking before the public health uh, issues, these can be measures, for instance, so that humanitarian aid isn't diverted to military purposes or that, um, you know, to prevent corruption, um, to ensure, for instance, that medicines are according to the proper standards uh, required, etc. So there are clearly administrative measures that states and religions can impose on humanitarians. Now, public health um, measures, such as the ones on lockdown, on freedom of movement, um, you know, um, restricting freedom of movement, restricting freedom of goods, are also measures that in themselves and are probably um, are legitimate uh, in order to, um, to curb uh, this pandemic. But a balance then needs to be found between those legitimate measures and the, of the right of people to be ensured their basic needs. And so if those measures lead to a de facto denial of consent to humanitarian relief and a complete deprivation of people, say people in IDP camps, detainees, etc., uh, of their basic needs, if people thereby are completely denied food, water, uh, medical care, then that balance isn't there. It's not easy to so, and that needs to be decided really case by case in each, you know, in each different conflict situation. 
it's a question of a constant dialogue also, I think, between you know, international humanitarian organizations, local organizations which have a big role to play, um, and, and governments. Um, what I can say, though, is that, um, for instance, the ICRC has received quite, um, you know, has received um, um, some exemptions uh, to such restrictions. So, for instance, on um, uh, we've been able to transport goods to Somalia, um, um, or you know, in Nigeria, we've been able to uh, to also uh, transport goods to people. Uh, we've had exemptions in in certain other countries. We've been able, for instance, also to bring um, uh, humanitarian relief across the front lines in Ukraine to the Donbas. So we have um, we have had some success in in getting those uh, exemptions. It remains to be seen whether there is a trend of humanitarian relief being um, impacted negatively by COVID. So far, we can't uh, we can't um, I think uh, judge that yet. Um, so, so I think it is a question of dialogue and, and very often that dialogue can also uh, lead to better exemptions. I have to say though that uh, at the ICRC, the thing we are struggling the most with is uh, international movement of our staff. Uh, we have a lot of international staff and, uh, and it's extremely difficult to, um, to move them around uh, in order to, uh, to do uh, our job. Of course. I have one, this will be our last question as we're running, we're running over time. Um, but for Kate, this is a question posed by a journalist who has asked the White House and the State Department about the proposed global ceasefire, the ceasefire proposed by the UN Secretary General. In response, uh, he, has, he has learned that, or he has received the response that the United States supports the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire, but has noted that we will continue to fulfill our legitimate counterterrorism measure. Can you weigh in on this, uh, on this kind of contradiction about both participating in a global ceasefire and yet um, continuing a global war on terror? Sure. Uh First and foremost, you can't support a call for a ceasefire while continuing military operations um, that first and foremost are going to have an impact not only on the people living in the countries where the United States is at war, but also carries the threat of spreading the virus further, not only to impacted populations, um, but other warring parties, as well as US service members. And so I think it shows the the continued hubris of the United States government to think it's an exception to the global rules and norms that we say we want to support, but ultimately often end up violating or ignoring when it suits our quote unquote national interest. And I think that is where a key failing of the United States that not only undermines its credibility on the international stage in terms of leading efforts for global cooperation or recognition of human rights um, or the realization of universal human rights, um, but also it ultimately makes the United States less secure. Uh, this is a key moment to be recognizing that um, conflict and violence do not are not resolved through more violence. We have over two decades of this point of trying to resolve and prevent conflict through the use of violence. And if anything, that's exacerbated the security challenges and the violence um, in dozens of countries around the world. And so this pandemic not only shows that it's a time for rethink to actually perhaps, you know, beg the question, does the threat posed by violent groups that perpetrate terrorism actually have a military solution? Or should the United States be taking this opportunity to perhaps rethink its approach fundamentally and focus on actually addressing local drivers to conflict, which are often rooted in governance failure, lacking economic opportunity, poverty, and other things that drive the influence of these groups and make individuals susceptible to recruitment. Um, and finally, I think if we are trying to um, 
you know, lead by example or set the rules of the international system, we have to hold ourselves accountable. And so by the U.S. declaring a ceasefire, we could have a very positive impact on other parties around the world who are in conflict and send the signal that we have the expectation that they do the same. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to all of the panelists that for a very vibrant discussion and for your contributions today. We've covered a lot of topics, a lot of ground, and I think we could speak for much longer, but unfortunately we'll have to end here. I'll close with a couple of reminders. There is a recording of this event and closed captioning, which will be available at the series website, which is tinyurl.com slash COVID-19 justice series. And secondly, we didn't get to discuss too much the situations of refugees and migrants and asylum seekers, but we will have an excellent event tomorrow at the same time, same Zoom setting. Um, and a particularly timely topic given Trump's announcement of the immigration ban, the discussion will focus on COVID-19 and its response, risks to refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers. And we hope that you can join us for that as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.